Uh, shall I do the cold open? Or should we uh, plan get the notes. Okay. Uh, let me close out of Diablo, because I really don't feel like playing loot quest while, uh, while we record the show. I can do that later. We had leftover E3 stuff, Prometheus, uh, Worldwide Developers Conference happened. That's Apple's press show. They didn't announce a ton, but some things. I hadn't heard anything. What did they announce? A uh, new MacBook Pro, iOS 6 with better Siri... Uh, Facebook integration in OS X and Funny, iOS. we were just talking about Siri. Yeah, our friend Nate apparently hates Siri. Hates Siri? Yeah. Well, hates Apple because of Siri. Because they record what people say to Siri. They they record and keep apparently everything that you say to Siri. You do need to be on the internet in order to use her. Right. But... Uh, I just Siri figured it was so the that they could imp- I just figured so that they could improve, you know, how the thing fucking works. Right. Uh-huh. She's supposed to learn from us, right? The company isn't going to bloody do anything nefarious with what you're asking your robot secretary. <laughs> where does Siri where are my keys? <laughs> All of the actual processing of the audio takes place on servers. Your phone yeah, does not she do has to she work. has to take that clip from what I understand and run it through and compare what does this audio translate to for words? Right. Right. Both that and deciding... Also, I'm I'm using she instead of it for an AI that might be... (laughs) Have you guys both watched the trailer for Prometheus yet? Uh, I remember seeing it. Yeah, because it did the bong thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think we watched that. Okay. If you haven't... Oh, yeah, we both have. Or all three of us have, so that's good because I don't want to talk it about the, it. It does that like cut flash wong. Yeah, it, it does wong. the. Uh, oh, hold on, the I, should, I want to send you a link about this. Um. And it's 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 it was actually distressing for me to watch as someone who cuts together video. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, Pyro, before we start, I want you to watch the trailer for Wreck It Ralph. And Brandon. Because I'm going to want to talk about those as upcoming things. Alright, we'll trade links then. Hang on. Trade links. Um, Movies. I I can watch anything you send on Veronica's computer, so. Like, those are the two movies that are coming out that I'm super excited about right now. The audio for this is from a giant bomb cast, and the video was put together by a listener. Okay. <laughs> Why was Reggie there? <laughs> you know what, Reggie fuse me in Gears? I'd play that. Oh, there were also pieces of, like, that new, um, Beyond and, game. Like, and everything was in there. Was Tomb Raider and Assassin's that was Creed. everything from E3 in one trailer. That was pretty good. Yeah, I, I did enjoy that. Alright, you need to watch the trailer for Wreck-It Ralph. How do you spell that? Uh, W-R-E-C-K-I-T. It. Yeah. It should be like one of the top things. It's a Disney film that features classic gaming characters. Like, I'm like, how did they afford these licenses? That, that apparently oh, oh, some I remember people... this. This is the... The... Who, who framed Roger Rabbit of games, except... Who kind Framed of? Roger Rabbit was famous for having Bugs Bunny and... Well, the weird thing is, like, people are getting mad at the trailer for calling Zangief a villain. A villain. Oh, bad guy. Yeah. Zangief was never a good guy. He was the big physically imposing guy. In... Also, he was Russian, which was clearly... Yeah. <laughs> also pile drivers. Yeah. Like, pretty much the only way to beat Zangief in Street Fighter 2 is to play a projectile spamming character. Yeah, the other trailer to watch is uh, Branded, which looks like it's going to be a total mindfuck of a movie. Yeah, we got tons like, of stuff. Like, the IMDB describing Branded makes it sound terrifying. Well, that's kind of disappointing. Huh. 
So the revealed plot for the World War Z movie? Yeah. Um isn't following the book at all? Yeah, the, like, the book the, is Yeah, it's not. Well, and of that's course not, because old. that takes place over across such a huge timeline, how could they? But the well, book is kind of a documentary slow yeah, plotting the, worldwide. It the doesn't idea have of the a narrative book, through line. Yeah, and well, yeah, not it, does, to, not it to follows a narrative of how mention. the zombie war happened, and what happened during it, and how we got through it. The problem is, movies about zombies, they want to take place during the event, during the breakdown. I don't know, I think it could really be cool to have... We want to see the zombie part. We don't want to see, like, the how society moves on and shit afterwards. At least not, we, we might want to see that at the end or whatever, but we want to see the zombies. Well, yeah, we want to see the zombies, but I think by using, like... Just throw some fucking zombies well, in there. By <laughs> using, like, found footage, store, secu store security cameras, military uh, footage, you could still really do that. So you want... I want them to do Chronicle with zombies. So While the survivors the are telling the stories. You want them to make a much smarter, more subtle, and different oh, film man. than I was going to tell you Chronicles on Netflix. Studio system. Oh, dude, sweet! I'm gonna watch that later. Yeah, I was going to tell it you. It was like, such a good movie. A while ago, but uh, supposedly, did you hear about the sequel to that? Are we recording right now? By yes, the way, yes, we are. Good. I didn't some, do my open yet. Because some of this is going to be really good. Um, supposedly, we're getting a sequel to Should Chronicles. Should I do my open? Let's do it. No, open. not yet. Ah, damn. It. Okay. I'm Sam. And I'm Pyro Sam, and I did not edit out most of that pre-show talk. So, you're getting the, the intro in the middle of the show. <laughs> Why? Well, not, not the <laughs> Couldn't the show, we just, like, pick it up and move Pyro it? Sim is not editing this. Why well, can't we work. just pick it up and move it? Okay, actually, I will pick it up and move it, and then you'll be very confused when you hear what I said, like, ten seconds ago. He's gonna put it at the end. You'll get over it. <laughs> oh my god. Anyway. So, Chronicle. Well, welcome to Nerd Talk, Train Wreck Edition. So, the supposed sequel for Chronicle is not going to take the form of a found footage film like the original did. Loved that. Um, so Pyro, did you ever get to see it? I never managed to see Chronicle. God, we Netflix, can't spoil sir, then. you will enjoy. I don't think he has but Netflix. But supposedly, but he what, should, what we're getting in the sequel to Chronicle is the first real villain for that world. Because, like, you you can't cover up the events of Chronicle. There, there's no way that they could have done that. So it's acknowledged in this world that, yes, yeah, superheroes are a thing. We have this now. And what we're going to have in Chronicle 2 is the rise of the actual first villain in that Other world. Than the... Andrew Other than was the more confused. He wasn't out and out evil. Uh, right. By the end of it, kind of. Because he was, well, he was in some kind of weird yeah. delirium. He, he was... Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> yeah, he was... Structurally, he He man. was thoroughly disturbed by that point. But no, we're actually going to have someone in Chronicle 2 who is actively evil and using these powers to hurt people. Hmm. Like, I, I, I Andrew was... By the end, lots out. of people got hurt well, in the first An movie. <laughs> it, Andrew was lashing out mm -hmm. because he was confused, hurt, scared, all that. Mm-hmm. We're going to have someone who's truly malicious in the sequel. And that's kind of awesome. I'm just saying, um, as soon as you get to the tormenting small animals part, that's that's where you cross the villain threshold. Right. And he was pulling the legs off of arachnids, so... Fair enough. I'm just, I'm excited to get to see more of this world. I like what they've set up. And were you excited to see more of the aliens world when you went to see Prometheus? Oh, hey, oh, good segue. And we've segued into the first uh, and, review and of tonight. And joins the long tradition of podcasts who take good segues and then and spend ruin them by talking, talking about, about them. the segues. <laughs> that segue was great. Great segue, well, it was Bob. Pretty good. I mean, more segue. Not lie. I'm pretty <laughs> handsome. No. Okay. Not unlike that. All right. Shut up. Don't ruin trailer. my shtick, okay? If we have a thing, we're gonna do our thing. So right now we're going to be talking about Ridley Scott's Prometheus, which premiered last Friday. I went to a midnight screening. And you screening. did go to a midnight showing, so tell us about that. I did. So Prometheus, as anyone who has any kind of connection to the internet will know, is set up as an indirect prequel 
to the Aliens uh, franchise. We have uh, director. Do we Rin- care about spoilers? No, yeah, we're we're going right into spoilers because okay. I don't care. Like this is spoiler. We are about to spoil Prometheus. Okay, I I don't think there's much spoiler. to spoil. Uh, you probably won't be too harsh off if you get spoilers. Right. I mean, this movie the, has the problems. We are spoiling with, it because it was awful. The the big thing <laughs> with Prometheus is that we already know every major thing in the plot from the trailer and from the hype material. Really? You managed to figure out every plot device from. Well, yeah, because we know from the information that, huh, the... That was my impression of that trailer, by the, the way. The space jockey from the Alien franchise, we, we know from the trailer that, hmm, these are apparently the people responsible for creating humans on Earth. We figured that out. We're showing that in the first 30 Did seconds humans? of the movie. Yeah. Huh. Humans are the offspring of the space jockey cool. uh, people. Like, at the very start of the movie, you see one of them left on a... a a, a developing Earth, he drinks this cup of mysterious black fluid, and it causes him to dissolve, effectively seeding his genetic code. It was clearly Jack Daniels. <laughs> yeah. Jack Daniels just causes his genetic <laughs> well, I mean, code to fall let's apart. Let's be honest, that's what happens what? when I drink Jack Daniels. As I turn into goo, and then my genetic code take, spreads around the Earth. It takes him a few million years to, to recongeal as a lesser species. But maybe so, just a lesser uh, form, as I drink Jack Daniels, and then my genetic code spreads around the room. <laughs> Mostly through the form of him just defecating on everything. <laughs> That's not too much DNA and poo. We will never get a sponsorship from Jack Daniels now. <laughs> nope. Um, so yeah, we, we know that from watching the trailer. We know that this is uh, based in the Aliens universe by looking at the architecture around uh, all the scenes that are shown. We know that Guy Pierce is in it from the hype material. Like, despite the fact that it it made a big point as a <gasps> Guy Pierce is in this when the movie uh, when you're actually watching the film, like we know he was there because he was in the opening credits and he was in the hype material. Like seeing Guy Pierce with old man prosthetics is almost laughable when he appears in the movie, and it's supposed to be a really huge plot device. It's like a big deal that oh my god. Old Man Guy Pierce is really here. That seems nope. almost unprecedented that they're setting this story in the Aliens universe, but not attaching the Aliens license to it from a marketing perspective. But That's... they did, though, because everyone knew about it. Uh, we know, like, but we're pundits. We, we, we keep track of this stuff. because Anyone nervous. who followed uh, the hype machine attached to this movie that, knew that. I kind of hate that word. Pundit? Geeks, yeah. fanboys, <laughs> well, I mean... Pick your flavor. Yeah, movie you know, buffs. I don't know. I hear pundits and I immediately think of... Of the people I, babbling that's, that's on Fox News. That's because your parents watch Fox News. Yeah. Right. Okay, no, I, I, I can that, see that's how that actually, could sour yeah, you on not, the word. That's, okay, yes, but I mean just as a word. Like, as a co- collection of phonemes, I, am, I imagine that that word translates to someone who, like, has pudding on their face. Does that make sense? <laughs> What's and that would be the audible sound of the face palming. <laughs> d- d- that doesn't make any sense, does it? Like, that's the, that's like, I don't know, certain words give you a mental image just from how they sound. And that's, right. So, that is mine. The font <laughs> continuing with the icing. Prometheus review, I mean, jeez. <laughs> the, the sidecar has now crashed. Let's get back, back to the link. Um, so, basically, the plot of Prometheus... Uh, Two scientists from Earth, uh, paleontologists... Wait, that's dinosaurs, aren't they? Yeah. Paleontologists only study dinosaurs. Um, archaeologists, thank you. Yeah. Uh, ancient Earth archaeologists... You learned that from Mass Effect, didn't you? I think so. <laughs> ...have found a, a star map spread across several ancient Earth civilizations and believe that this is a map to the creators of the human race. The problem with this plot point is that the the lead female scientist, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, is deeply Christian. Unfortunately, Christianity, the theory of an all-powerful god, doesn't follow along with the ancient aliens theory. Uh, everything you've told me so far sounds like you watched 2001 A Space Odyssey. 
because it's the precursors put the obelisk, which seeds human development, and then they yep. go to Jupiter to find God. Right. Um, so yeah, they they fly out to this planet in deep space. It takes them two years to get there with like state of the art trillion dollar technology. And, and they're going like a seven minute sequence where the guy is in his escape pod and it's just trippy psychedelic colors on screen. Not quite. <laughs> yeah, I actually just sat through a screening of two thousand one. I didn't see Prometheus. <laughs> they lied to me. Um, but like. One of the big problems I have is that their expedition is funded by the Wayland Corporation. Everyone who's seen Alien knows what Wayland Utani is. Uh, you've got Utani from the later Predator films, and then you've got, uh, well, this is the origin of Wayland Corp, who apparently are into terraforming. So you're telling me that for going out for potentially first contact with the species that created the human race, you're going to send 17 scientists. Or, sorry, um, correction, 14 scientists, a pilot, and his two co-pilots. That's what you're sending to meet the race that started humanity. No diplomats, no soldiers, no oh, engineers. <laughs> sorry. Like, really? That's going to be a thing. 17 people, you know what? Even better correction, 13 people, one homicidal robot. Because uh, cool. it, it's inevitable that in the aliens universe, the artificial people are always going to want to kill the humans. Isn't even, that like basically every movie trope ever? E even Winona Ryder, you know, she wasn't friendly at all. She's Winona Ryder. Are you, are you saying that Winona Ryder's a robot? I'm not disconfirming it. I'm pretty sure that's not a word. One of the things I've heard said is that, uh, I mean, it kind of makes sense to me that you send the scientists on this exploration mission, but once they get there, they're kind of very uninterested in the fact that they're exploring precursor ruins, and they're like, right. not very excited by this idea. No, they, they in fact did the most half-assed job of exploring the the ruins as possible. They only go into one structure. They only stay in that structure for about an hour before they have to evacuate because of an incoming uh, silica storm. It's apparently a thing on this planet. Silica being dirt. <laughs> they manage to lose two of their crewmen more interesting than on this answer. initial expedition. Like, one of them being the geologist who invented the really cool, like, scanning probes that, uh, that you saw in the trailer. Like, these really cool devices. You just hold them up in the air, and then they fly through the tunnels on their own and map everything. The guy who invented these got lost. Ironic. Really. The guy who has the device that is actively flying through this place, scanning everything, couldn't find his way back to the entrance. Clearly, somebody didn't teach one of his Pokemon Flesh. Right. Like, the plot points in this movie just do not add up. Um, that... So, th while searching these ruins, they find, like, these containers of black goo that immediately respond to uh, life form's presence by leaking that can manage to, in the span of a few hours create a proto-life form that is poisonous, um, extremely strong, and utterly, like, dedicated to killing people. And it's also shaped like a penis. It is totally shaped like a penis. It is shaped like a penis that's head then spreads out into a vagina. So, that is the first thing you so said. So, like anything designed aliens, based right? on Geiger art, it's going to be entirely phallic. Horrific Penis Monsters is Alien 101. That's, that's right. what I want in this universe. They're there. Okay. Um, right. But so, like, I, I will give credit that the absolute best performance in this movie... Do they hiss and then explode? Wow. Off topic yet again. Does the it's scientist then topic. treat the it's horrific penis, penis monster like it's a house cat? Yes, yes he does. I'm guessing you've does seen a review of this. Does that result in him being killed horrifically? Horribly. 
Like, Wait, what? This, was what a, this was supposed to be the biologist of, of the team. The person who is there to study foreign life forms. So xenobiology? Huh? Basically, yeah. He here, should have been able to look at this here. thing and go, on my arm. I probably shouldn't be messing with this. But no, of, the Prime uh, of course, he is absolutely going to treat the thing like it is a harmless, fluffy little kitten. <laughs> Did you just say whittle? Yep. And as a result, have his arms snapped in half, have the thing shatter his visor, and leap down his throat. Perfect. Meanwhile, his friend who tried to cut the thing's tail off got acid sprayed in his face. And then somehow, his body coming in contact with the black fluid turned him into a super zombie. That could, like, shatter people's helmets with his fist. None of this is explained as to how it happened throughout the entire movie. Like, super zombie just came into the ship, killed, like, four people. We're never gonna talk about it again. Is this black goo that um, started all this the same as the Jack Daniels from the beginning? I have no idea because it was never explained. That seems like it's it's dark liquids, the seeding life forms. Again, never explained. As a um, horror trope, it seems like there's a problem here in that if there's monsters in this uh, pyramid precursor ruins that they're exploring. They, but they there just kind of leave. There aren't really monsters here. That's the weird thing. Everything stems from this black goo, and at no point is it ever described what this is or what it's capable of. Like, the android takes a drop of it and puts it in one of the scientist's drinks, and just, like, he slowly starts to fall apart during the uh, next couple hours. Like, mentally or physically? Everything. Mentally, physically, until he eventually encourages the uh, the corporate representative to burn him with a flamethrower. He willingly suicides himself out of this film. Sounds like, like it's doing okay on the visuals front so at, far. At no point is it described what this shit is or does besides it is clearly a biological weapon. That That's the conclusion they come to. This isn't their home world. Clearly we're at a weapons development planet. They somehow also jump to the conclusion that, oh, the engineers, because that's what they call the people who created the human race, they're, they're now the engineer race, they wanted to go to Earth and destroy it with this stuff. Where they got this idea? I'm not sure. Yeah, at one point in the movie, the android David goes into the uh, the pilot's chamber and pulls up a star map that that has the Earth on it. But that would be a duh thing. Obviously, these people know where the Earth is. That's not really a question. Them being pissed off to see humans? Like, really? I don't know if I were an alien race that had dominated the galaxy and saw a lesser race in my stuff. I would be confused. I would be pissed off. I'd probably try to kill them for my own safety. It seems like if these are the uh, much older and more powerful race than humans, and they wanted Earth destroyed, wouldn't Earth have already been destroyed? Right. These can't be the only people who were, who were representing this race. There's bound to be a homeworld of the bloody things who would be like, Hey, whatever happened with that Earth place? Did, did those guys ever get there? Like, you can't tell me that this was a project that was, like, given out centuries ago because they said the ruins were 2,000 years old. They carbon dated the, uh, the body of one of the uh, engineers. You can't tell me that it was just like, oh, yeah, did, did those guys do their job? Ah, uh, yeah, I guess they did. <laughs> like, we'll just leave them alone. Probably fine. 2,000 years of government bureaucracy doesn't work that way. Eventually, some guy's going to find the memo that was like, destroy Earth. Oh, that done. Let's get some new guys on that. Th 
the frustrating thing about this movie is that there's so much potential here. I am 100% sure there is like an hour extra director's cut of this movie that is brilliant. Because every Ridley Scott movie has like an extra hour somewhere. It, it'll be the explain shit version. It always is, too. Yeah, because when you're not editing for theater time slots, you can actually explain it. But the original Alien didn't explain very much. Well, I mean... It's not just But it explained enough. It's not just, like, out front explanations, I feel, but, like... How do I want to put this? A lot of important things tend to end up on cutting room floors. Right. I remember... Whether it's due to time constraints. I remember or, the original Alien explaining... Oh, this thing latched on his face. Oh, this thing must have implanted an egg in his chest. Oh, this thing is a horrible monster that bleeds acid that's going to kill us. That's that, all that's you needed all to the explain. Facts, and really all of the facts you need. Right. However, like Prometheus, there's this black goo that apparently can do everything to kill people. Like, at, at one point, the main character, Dr. Shaw, finds herself impregnated by the other scientist when he was infected with the alien black goo. And that causes her to gestate this horrible alien squid thing, which is apparently a precursor. It's a chestburster. Yeah, it's a precursor to the chestbursters. It's like a proto-chestburster. The way I've heard the problem with Prometheus described is not even just that the film does not explain what is going on, but that it does not seem like it knows what's going on. Yeah, that, that's the exact problem. There were no clear limits to what this black goo stuff could do. It, it could just apparently do anything that kills people. It, it was capable of creating a super strong zombie. That managed... You know, that's a credit right there. So the, the geologist who went into the structure got himself killed By inside of it. Getting lost. Yeah. Got goo sprayed, or, or got venom sprayed in his face, which caused him to fall down dead in the black goo, which revived him as a super zombie. The super zombie found its way out! And found its way back to the ship! How? Smart zombie. Right! So... Like, it makes super zombies, it causes, like, horrible alien monsters to gestate somehow, it can dissolve human flesh, it can cause proto-penis monsters to spawn, and if consumed by an engineer, you it causes... You just use the phrase gestate and penis monsters in the same breath. I know, this is a really weird movie. <laughs> like, they, they do the whole body horror thing very well. Like, it has one of the most uncomfortable surgical scenes ever in a movie, as Dr. Shaw climbs into a machine to give herself a, like, a, a complete abdominal removal of this thing. Because she originally asked the machine, give me a cesarean now. Get this thing out of me. And the machine is like, I'm sorry, I'm only designed to work for male patients. And so she just thinks of the next possible thing along those lines. She's like, for an object in abdomen, remove. The problem with that logic is earlier in the movie, when you were first shown this machine... Why would you put a machine that does that it, it's on an, a machine? It's an all-surgery machine. It does all types of surgery. Except you just said it's only designed for use on right. male patients, so why would you put that on a facility that's going to have females that need medical attention. Well, let, let me explain this machine further. So it's sitting in Charlie's Theron's character... Robots? It's sitting in Charlie's Theron's character's private quarters. She apparently has a corporate executive suite built into an escape pod. So they assume, assume only men are corporate executives? I, I, this still well, doesn't make sense. Well, again, this is, we're going to continue with the not making sense stream. When Dr. Shaw asks about it, Charlie Theron's character explains that that's my personal medical unit in case of emergencies. You don't get to touch it. Does this mean that Charlie Theron's character is either A, a complete moron who didn't check out her technology when she bought it, or B, 
actually wielding a penis. That could be. Maybe the black goo did it. I mean, at, at one point, it's revealed that she's actually Peter Whelan's offspring. Earlier in the movie, Whelan makes the quote that David, uh, the robot played by Michael Fassbender, is the closest thing he has to a son. At the time, I assumed that line meant he really loves this robot. Mm -hmm. What I have to take that line as now is that Charlie's Theron is transgender. Ugh, this is going in a weird direction. It is. Place. And I'm sitting in the theater going... No, I mean, your interpretation of this is going in a weird place I don't think we ought to touch. Like... Uh, I am skeptical that your reading is in the text, really. Our, yeah, our, I haven't seen the movie. We are intensely sounds... privileged cisgendered. I, so... I, I don't know what it means that this, this machine overtly explained, I only work on men, hence I cannot perform the cesarean. It is in Charlize Theron's room. I she has that... explained that it is hers... For her alone. Do not touch it. I guess the only thing we can really chalk that up to at this point is bad writing. Yes, that's exactly what I'm going to chalk this up as. I don't think the writer I think it actually thought this one through very well. Like the one possible And also the writer's probably a male. One possible theory that I heard was that the device was intended for Peter Whalen, who was actually on the ship. And she was just covering that up. But why would she have been so protective of that if she's just pretty much waiting and trying to get him killed? Like, that seemed to be an overarching plot of the movie that, yeah, everyone just wants Peter Whalen dead. He's like a hundred something years old, he's on the spaceship flying out to the to the ass end of nowhere to pretty much beg the engineers to extend his life so he assumes they can do that seems like a crappy way to spend your final days of existence like there are so many plot points in this movie that just do not add up and it's a shame because so many actors in this movie give amazing performances um uh Ibris Elba may be one of my favorite actors he is amazing as the pilot in this movie. He is funny. He, all of his scenes are fantastic. Is he doing the fake American accent again? Yes, he is doing fake American again. That's so weird. He's good at it, but... It's yeah, so he, weird. he was definitely playing in, uh, an, an American character. Um, Charlie Stern gives a that, great but... performance as the cold-hearted uh, corporate executive. Uh, the... the uh, Numi Rapace, or Rapace, Dr. Shaw, is phenomenal in this movie. I mean, the Alien franchise is always known for strong female characters, and she is a great addition to that lineup. She is just as good as Sigourney Weaver was as Ripley. Well, good performances, good creature design. I, everything has to be laid at the feet of the screenplay at this point. Yeah, I want to give full credit to Michael Fassbender, who is phenomenal as David in this movie. Like, if there's one reason to go see Prometheus, it is for Michael Fassbender's performance. He is amazing at that I'm made to be, or I'm made to seem human, but I'm not quite there. It is perfect. It is the best rendition of that you will ever see in a film. Like, everything Haley Joel Osment tried to do in the movie AI, he has mastered. He has that it's just off like he can do the uncanny valley thing perfectly where this isn't quite human there's just something a little off that the audience can detect and it's perfect the opening of the movie is literally just him having been around this ship for two years watching movies trying to to learn about humans just doing his duties like, there, there's one part of it where he's riding a bicycle around the ship's gym, shooting baskets, like only an artificial person with too much time on their hands could do. And but it's the great. The lead screenwriting credit for Prometheus goes to John Spates, whose only other screenwriting credit 
is for a $30 million Russian disaster movie called The Darkest Hour. Oh, wow, and that was also a bad one. The other screenwriting credit is Damon Lindelof, whose only significant screenwriting credit is Lost. And yeah, I, the, the point where this movie completely falls apart is in its screenplay. And it's sad, because the special effects are so good. The... The environments, the setting is so good. The premise is amazing. The acting is phenomenal. And it just falls apart in the screenwriting. Lost and Cowboys and Aliens. Which Cowboys and Aliens I liked quite a bit. But I don't know that it had... Its screenplay was workable rather than superb. I, I walked out of Prometheus going, there are so many elements of this movie that are fantastic but it doesn't add up to a good film. Alright. We got lots of other stuff, so I guess we'll just yep. chop we, Prometheus we, off as it, it had potential and did not meet it. Is it worth seeing? Yeah, totally. Like, if you've got some time on your hands and you can find a, a theater you can go to for, like, a couple bucks, do it. it, it there are better ways to spend two hours. Is it... A, f a fantastic film that I could watch any time? No. No, it's not, unfortunately. I'm pretty convinced that when a director's cut of it comes out with an extra hour worth of explanation, I'll totally be in on that. But as it stands right now, Prometheus is not a great movie. So there's no news to this, but a game came out today. A very important game. A Suda51 game. Oh. A game with a disembodied head. <laughs> so, I was hoping y'all would forget. Lollipop Chainsaw's release date is June twelfth, which is today as we're recording this. Bring it. You have to uh, get it now. Thus far, it's would. actually been getting surprisingly good reviews. Much I'm... better reviews than Suda Fifty One games usually get. Suda 51 Which, games are usually known for being great. We promised to do a Let's Play, and that didn't really... Suda 51 games are usually play. known for being great in every aspect other than their gameplay. I disagree because I thoroughly enjoy both of the No More Heroes games. Like, I, I love that franchise. Um, Killer7 is still ridiculously cool. We'll have more on Lollipop Chainsaw in the future. I mean, I'm, I'm what Suda51 is truly known for is he releases great games that are always critical hits that never sell well. Yeah. That I too. think Lollipop Chainsaw might be his best chance of having it's a had its, its biggest marketing game. effort behind it. Oh, yeah. When you've got Warner Brothers money behind your game, you should be able to do pretty well. I'm uh, trying to find the Apple earlier Worldwide reviews Developers of Conference Chainsaw. happened this week. There was not a whole lot of stuff at it. Uh, iOS 6 was announced, and it's released for developers. It'll be coming to consumers soon. They upgraded the MacBook Pro by eliminating the 17-inch size and putting a, quote, retina display on the smaller laptops. And I kind of have a bone to pick with the marketing of the retina display which is that I'm very excited about pixel density, and if you have more resolution in a screen of a certain size, I like that. But the pixel density of the new MacBook Pro with Retina display is only 220 pixels per inch, which is dramatically less than the 320 pixels per inch of the first Retina display in the iPhone 4. And back when the iPhone 4 came out, it was like kind of an iffy thing as to their claims about the retina display, uh, Steve Jobs said that the pixels are indistinguishable, and that was about true if you had average or poorer vision and held the phone at, like, fully arm's length away from you and not any closer. But, I mean, that's, that's pretty good, and it was a much better pixel density than anything else. But this pixel density is still lower than was on my original droid, and they're calling it Retina. It's practically missing a third of the resolution of, or a third of the density of the original Retina display. So, 
Eh, I, I'm excited about anything that's better than 1980 by 1020, because the monitor's LCD has got to a point for a long time where 1920 by 1080 was HD, and people decided that there was no need to get any better than that. It was stuck for a long time. So this will probably signal a transition to higher than 1920 by 1080 in common computer LCDs. They announced that Siri would be improved in some way that's not really specific. Uh, one thing they did say is that there's now eyes-free stuff coming for cars. That's one of the big promises of Siri is that you can read and send your text messages easily while driving, and it was 99% there, but is still wanted you to look at the screen every so often, and they're emphasizing eyes-free mode. Hmm. They also announced Facebook integration for iOS and OS X, a deep system-level Facebook integration, which I'm kind of sour on, because Facebook integration is kind of great, but the way they're doing it is that uh, Facebook is much specialer than anything else. Uh, compare this to the way Android works, which is that Android potentially allows apps to do things at the system level if the user confirms that they wants to give the app those permissions. So Facebook, without any special business deals with Google, develops an app that has system level integration and it'll show your Facebook status of your friends from your recent calls in your phone. That's, that's pretty cool. But theoretically, any company could do that if they had an exciting platform and use for it. Whereas in iOS, it's Facebook is a super special snowflake that did a business deal with Apple and nothing else will be like this. I also don't use Facebook very much, so... System-level Twitter integration would do more for me. But I also don't use an iOS device, so I guess it's all moot. Fair enough. Um, I have recently been reading Megatokyo on my Galaxy Nexus. Wait, and that's still going on? It is still going on, and it's still updating very wow. infrequently. But the art is really nice to look at. And on the incredible uh, 316 PPI screen, which is slightly lower than the iPhone 4 and even more slightly lower than the iPhone 4S, it still looks really, really good to have all those pixels in that small space. Uh, Indie Game the Movie came out today. Follows the development of Super Meat Boy, Braid, and Fez. Cool. It's been screening privately for a while, but now the general public can watch it. Yep. People say that it's really good. It's $10. I am currently looking up whether the most recent Humble Indie Bundle is still going on. It is on for another day and a half, which, if I edit this quickly, then the viewer who listens to it immediately will have like a day to get to it. And at this point... Uh uh, if you spend $8.42, you receive uh, not only all four of the base games, uh, Super Brothers, Limbo, Amnesia, and Psychonauts, but you will also receive Bastion, Lone Survivor, Braid, and Super Meat Boy, as well as the soundtracks for Sword and Sorcery, Limbo, Amnesia, Psychonauts, and Bastion. I bought this for more than the average early on because... I already owned every game except for Super Brothers, but they, I knew that they add things for people who pay more than the average. Right. I already own Bastion, Lone Survivor, Braid, and Super Meat Boy. So I, basically I only I brought Super Brothers. I kind of want to pick this up just to get Bastion. Admit it, I know every game really in good. this is wonderful. But uh, yeah, that's the one I've really been interested in for a while. And if I can get it for 10 bucks, good deal. Yeah. Also, uh, Notch spent... Twelve thousand dollars on this. Notch 
that does this has done this for a number of humble indie bundles. Yeah, his current contribution spent. total is twelve thousand three hundred and forty-five and sixty-seven cents. Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. He's been in a competition with the Humble Brony Bundle, which is a collective effort of a bunch of other people <laughs> to basically donate more than Notch. Right. And they're losing because Notch is incredibly wealthy. Yeah, I'll do that. All right. Well, if I wish I had that much money to do that. Yeah, if I've still got a day to do this, I totally think I want to pick this up. Because I still have yet to play Super Meat Boy. I don't even know what Lone Survivor is. Anything where I can play Psychonauts is super cool. Ooh, Psychonauts has been on my wish list for a long, long time. But now you can have it for anything you want because it's a part of the uh, the pay anything group. Likewise, I've heard Limbo is just super trippy and interesting. As I already have all of these games other than Super Brothers, I think I'm going to give you my Steam key. Because if you pay more than, like, $1, I think, you also get a Steam key. You can download them DRM for the, from the site, but you can also associate them with your Steam account. Right. Which is probably well, put, where I'll be getting them. Yeah, I no, put $15 I... down and I already own them all, so... I, I, I can totally too see myself my doing this when my show is over tonight. Um, my Steam is 3 and 4. Yes, you do get to play Psychonauts. <gasps> it's a really good game. Yay. She's a happy pixie. I've been meaning to play this game for years. It's so I feel good. bad that I haven't. It's a really good game. My Steam history for Super Meat Boy says that I've played like 10 minutes of it, but the way Super Meat Boy works is that it gets you in the action really quick, and then you're doing these really tight platforming levels. So the way it works is that you fire up Super Meat Boy, and about 100 seconds later, you have died 50 times on this level. And you're like, fuck this level! And then you quit. So, I, I have a new goal for Diablo 3 that I want to talk about briefly, before we move on to more E3 stuff. Alright. So... Uh, today, Blizzard launched the Diablo 3 Real Money Auction House. Basically, while you're in-game, you can click a button that will change the currency that you're using from gold to actual currency that you can have. Blizzard can send you a check, I believe, is how they do it. Or they can credit an account. What I want to do I want to see if by playing the game on Hell, because I really doubt there's any way I'm going to get through Inferno by myself, I want to see if by getting rare items in Hell and selling them on the auction house for $1 a piece, if I can recoup the money I spent on Diablo 3. Well, if you spend enough time, then you certainly can. Well, the time investment required for that will undoubtedly be enormous. And that's what we're going to find out. Okay. How long do I have to play Diablo 3? And, and we can know this because the game is actively keeping track of how many hours and minutes I spend on my barbarian character, which is the character I'm going to do this challenge on. How many hours do I have to play Diablo 3 to recoup the money that I spent on Diablo 3? Many, many more hours than you'd have to spend if you spent those hours at your day job. Which pays rather well, I will say. <laughs> so, uh, one more thing about the Humble Indie Bundle is that its current total is standing at a little over four and a half million dollars in two weeks. And all these games are kind of old. Right. And I mean, Amnesia's been out for a while. Psychonauts was an Xbox One title. Braid's been out forever. They're like, all we DRM Braid free and pay what ago. you want. And they, this does not have the bump that the initial Humble Indie Bundle had, which is that the, the idea had never been done before. Since then, it has been cloned by Indie Gala and any number of other exact ripoffs of Humble Indie Bundle. Right. So this isn't unique anymore. It's not getting all of that s sudden press. Well, one of the and reasons just I'm seems... really into this one is because they're now including the soundtracks with the games, which I think is super cool. The soundtracks are pretty nice. 
Right. I mean, these I are mean, games with good soundtracks. I've wanted the that. Bastion soundtrack for a long time. I've wanted the Psychonaut soundtrack. I haven't heard the Limbo one, but I hear it's really haunting music that I could potentially use for role-playing games. So if you want to give somebody nightmares, you just set that up while they're sleeping. <laughs> I'll try this next time. Uh, actually, I'll try this before we go to Gen Con in two months. Uh, the argument I wanted to make is that you don't need to make things expensive or use DRM to make money on good games. You just sell good games, and they make lots of money with, with no DRM. That people could pirate these, people could pay one cent, a single penny, and get the bundle. But they made four and a half million dollars in two weeks. The... Jason Rubin, the new CEO of THQ, gave an interview to The Verge uh, earlier this week, wherein the interviewer had said that he'd never played Saints Row the Third because it was, quote, embarrassing, and it has a giant purple dildo bat in it, so I mean, that's, <laughs> that's kind of something you could say. He said he didn't want his family to know he was playing that. And there are there's a long list of games that I would put higher on the list than Saints Row the Third. And Jason Rubin said in response that with that team we should be able to make a game that is not embarrassing, and that caused a huge uproar on Twitter from all of the people who loved Saints Row the Third as they rightly should. Right. It was my personal game of the year 2011. Yeah, that um, that's kind of frustrating. And this is probably partially an instance of just bad wording, and the guy is a CEO and he was doing a goodwill tour, but he's going out giving lots of interviews because THQ has been in the dumps financially, and he was called in sort of to rescue the company. He's new there. So, he appears to be flustered that I just bought the Humble Indie Bundle during the show. No, no, not that at all. I'm... I'm freaking out over your weirdo neighbors who are shouting, Woo! A couple doors down. Woo! <laughs> because I heard that on the microphone, and I'm not sure if you guys did. They're, they're having very excited sex. <laughs> Woo! Uh, they're just standing still in the middle of an empty room with no expression on their face. Going and woo. every 60 minutes, they just yell, Woo! at the top of their lungs. They're like crazy monks. It's a religious thing. Woo! Alright. So, I, I don't know how I feel about this Jason Rubin interview. He may or may not know about how good the game is. And one of my arguments about Saints Row the Third is that it is very easy to say that it has a giant purple dildo bat in it, but it is... But at the same time, you're also saying, dude... This game has a giant purple dildo bat. <laughs> also that. But Saints Row the Third has a lot of other ideas in it. And it has characters who behave in ways that are literarily interesting. They make moral decisions. Uh, that does not really come across in one sentence the way the words dildo bat do. So it seems like a dumb game to people who haven't played it. And... The interviewer complaining about a game he hasn't played seems kind of dumb. And then the CEO in response saying that he wants to change the way the way the game is made, also kind of dumb. Yeah, it, it's kind of frustrating to be honest. Like, I, I think that's really crappy of a person to say. Yeah, why why would I ever play this game? It's embarrassing. Brian Crescente was the interviewer. Yep. It, it, it caused an uproar on Twitter, and I was also just kind of excited to see lots of other people who thought this was dumb. A good work, audience. Yeah, I, I completely disagree with the theory that, oh, yep, can't, can't play some games, those would be silly. Yes, Another like, interview that seriously, is... people have to review the, uh, the Dead or Alive Extreme Beach volleyball games. Like, that's actually a thing. Someone got paid to play and review that game. Yep. bastard. Another interview that was causing a bit of a buzz on Twitter 
and this one is even worse than the Jason Rubin one, is the executive producer of the upcoming Tomb Raider game, uh, John Rosenberg. Ron I was Rosenberg. just telling him about this earlier, but you go right ahead. Yeah, I saw this interview. This was also a bit disparaging. I, I was not as worried about the Tomb Raider game as some people prior to this interview, because, I, among other things, the Tomb Raider is shares a lot of genre conventions with the Uncharted games, and in Uncharted, there is specifically a giant spider and a very tight space that are shot for shot from the uh, Tomb Raider press footage, and you want to beat the crap out of your protagonist and have them overcome, because that's how drama works. Yeah, that, but that's then, dramatic. It, it's good for your character to go through a struggle and to feel like they actually had to accomplish something to, to finish the game. I mean, like, it, if a game wasn't a struggle, why was the player needed? And the feminist perspective is that really, if you put this character in this problematic situation, and because of her strength of wit and will and character, she overcomes, then, you know, that's empowering. That's fine. Yeah, right. Part of the idea then, of this new Tomb Raider game, as I understand it, is they're going to put Laura Croft through hell. They, they really beat the crap out of her. Yeah, but really she's way. going to come out of it. That has but. only been seen for Solid Snake in Metal Gear Solid 4. But this quote from but. the executive producer is that when people play Laura, they don't really project themselves into the character. They're more like, I want to protect her. And that is where everything fell apart for yeah. me. Yeah. Because if you're not supposed to identify with the lead character, and you're supposed to want to just protect the lead character, then she's a ragdoll, not a person. She's a damsel in distress. Uh, Which so. isn't what this Laura Croft is supposed to be giving as an impression at all. But that specific quote is what made it all fall apart for me. That also made the rounds on Twitter and everybody was very upset about it. As well they should have been. I, I mean, yeah, it says something positive about the gaming community that they are getting upset about these issues. That, that's a or maybe it, I just only follow people I respect. No, because, the, well, the fact that you can find people voicing these opinions at all is a great thing. The problem is, you can find people voicing I don't, any opinions because it's the internet. And it's, it's continuous. Uh, Pixie will know what I'm talking about. I don't have this link in the doc, but there is a screenshot of a YouTube page. Ah, uh, that. I can find that for you. So that we can put has, it in the link, don't a wide variety of incredibly disparaging remarks, which is not such a problem, except for the fact that the screenshot is unedited, and if you look at the percentage of people, there's a comment on this YouTube video for a Kickstarter about a documentary for women and games, the number of comments that just directly insult the person who wants to make this documentary for being a whore or a whiner or something or any bad thing is 99% of the comments. And then yeah. there's like one comment or two comments in this huge thread that are positive and everybody else is just incredibly horrible. I hear you. I kind of live in a bubble. The, the, by... com the comment section on the Kotaku article that highlighted it um, was the one that really made me lose faith in humanity, and I did that whole, like, single tier thing, just going down it, and that's when I decided I need to stop reading it. Right. I think it was Movie Bob that tweeted this, but he said... The original uh, post feminist... is from Feminist Frequency. Uh, actually, I was gonna. I was referencing something else. I think Movie Bob tweeted that uh, people get upset about feminism in that they think we want to take their stuff away, and I, I want to assert that feminists are not trying to destroy sexual depictions of women in media. As a matter of fact, every single feminist I know really loves sexy depictions of women. All they want is extra depictions of women in other ways. That are not just sexy, yes. 
We can uh, be depicted we, we... doing other things. We're great at doing stuff that's... We're sexy, yes. We're great at doing stuff besides being sexy. We would like recognition for that. I just, because it uh, really sucks when... Um, I don't want to say... I guess, I, guess the, I guess the word I'm looking for might be role models. But, like, who... You're, you're a kid and you're a boy and you've got, like, Ah, oh, yeah, these are all my cool heroes. Who do I get? <laughs> and that is exactly the, the thing that... Like when you're me like up in the playing pretend or whatever, who do you get? Is that if you're supposed to identify with this female protagonist, then heck, that is great. But the way he said it is that I am writing this for a male audience who is not intended to identify with this character. Uh, that's like, oh, well. And this I think that's disaster. completely wrong for the story. And like told. women, women like stuff that's marketed to men too. Like, we go see action movies and all this stuff. The assumption that things that are for girls is one, bullshit, and two, um, harmful in the, 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 the assumption is that things for girls don't make money. Or that guys won't want those because things for girls are bad, inherently. There's, uh, there's another a whole thing lot of problems with this. That tends to turn people outside the field off of feminism that is not really correct is that when we point out things that are problematic, uh, we're not really saying that you should not enjoy this in any way. We're just saying that you should be aware of the circumstances. And we're not saying that this shouldn't exist. We're just saying that we should understand where it's coming from right, well, and maybe make more things with that enlightenment. Interestingly enough, as much as I can claim that this show is predominantly featuring two established enlightened feminists, we're still excited about the, the camp and weirdness that will be Lollipop Chainsaw. At least I sure as hell am. And Byro seems to be in on this idea. I, if I, nothing I else, just more to... more excited about Lollipop Chainsaw since it got good reviews. Right. I uh, think looking at things like that through a feminist angle is interesting. It doesn't mean the thing is inherently bad, just because it brings some things into question and makes points about them. I can, can we also, can we just settle this shit right now? Also, I'm glad that we're not back on WLRA, which we will be this fall. Um, because, right, th this is a very profane show right now. Right. Um, Cut. my job's gonna get, Pyro, you and I, our jobs are gonna get a lot harder in, like, three months. <laughs> anyway. Can we just settle this crap where, oh, because men are depicted as stereotypically beefcakes or whatever, that means that, you know, you can't complain about women being stereotyped as sexy or well, whatever, because isn't, it's isn't the issue with, too. Isn't the issue with that always that that's a, a male power fantasy right there? Yes. One, it's created by men for right. men. Two, you're supposed to self-insert. And three, that's all about capability and agency right there, which are two things that women stereotypes in games absolutely lack. So does this mean you're going to get mad at Super Dungeon Explorer in a couple months when the princess character comes out? Is she completely incapable of doing anything? I have a feeling she won't be because they do a good job of making everyone have skills. But like, are she... her skills going to involve crying at things and sharing? She's carrying a heart wand, I know that much. I don't care about girly imagery as long as right. she's still capable. Girly things are not in themselves bad. Good, I'm glad we're explaining that. Th th that in itself is a sexist idea, that girly equals bad. That's that's misogyny right there in that you are you are conflating women with bad, or feminine identified things as bad. Right. Uh, well, one of the things I wanted to get at starting this segment is that you kind of win more people over with sugar than with vinegar, and th a lot of things that people have problems with feminists about are not actually things that feminists are trying to achieve. It's, uh, we don't want there to be no princesses. We want princesses to be one thing in a whole pantheon of things. Or right. maybe make princesses not always do, like, the same things, which is usually shrieking and doing nothing. Right, so a great example of this would be the upcoming Pixar film Brave, which yeah. a lot of people Ten are days, guys. super Ten excited days. about. And I hope they do it right, I hope to. It's Pixar. They'll be fine. I know. It's just, I feel like this could go very wrong, 
But from what I've seen, I'm very excited about I this. I don't think it's going to be a problem, to be all... To be Remember, honest, I have to be a little I, bit cynical. I think if it was going to be a problem, there would be a predominant stereotypical male character pictured in all of the production art mm -hmm. for the movie. Yeah, and the only one that seems to be like that is the father figure, and he seems to be encouraging The her. father, and then there's kind of the... I don't want to say antagonist, because I don't think that's their role, but the other clan of men mm -hmm. that seem to be showing up to try to gain her affection. And they're not exactly what I'd consider the the male protagonist stereotypes. Mm -hmm. They're not the kind that I would picture taking that role in this movie. I mean, I might get surprised here, but I don't think there's going to be a predominant male character that, that fits that role in this film. So I'm excited about it, and I really hope that it goes over right, but this is one thing that I might have to like show up for a midnight thing of. Pixar has watch. never made a bad movie. Yeah. yeah. It, even I disagree. Cars, cars exists. Yeah. Even just... including Cars. Well, you're not quite the audience for Cars, and even, even considering that. that you're not the audience for Cars, Cars was not a bad movie. Cars was not transcendent the way every other Pixar movie has been. But it wasn't bad. Right. I didn't personally it's find because you're Cars comparing to be it to an amazing such amazing film. other movies that Cars right. seem so pet pathetic in comparison. Right. I don't know. It just seemed kind of not just in comparison, it just was unimpressive to me because this that that was the first one that told me it was there to sell toys. Yeah. The rest of them were... Oddly enough, the one that predominantly featured toys wasn't there to sell toys. It didn't feel like that, though. Like, you know uh, you know how you kind of don't mind product placement in things as long as it doesn't like interrupt the story or whatever? It's like that. I'm sorry, I'm picturing a Mountain Dew machine turned into a Transformer. Yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> stuff like that ruins it. Uh, my biggest problem with cars was Larry the Cable Guy. He was okay in it. <laughs> I, I just kind of don't like him to begin with. <laughs> Yeah, he, he, he's a well, There he's goes our sponsorship person, from Larry the Cable Guy. I would have refused the him. Vacuum, There's not enough be. money. <laughs> I disagree. There is it. totally enough money, sir. You just called me sir. I, think I, I was talking to Larry. <laughs> so while we're talking about... He's one of the hundred or so people that download this show every week. <laughs> right. There's a thing that's been going around that in the new Lego Batman... Is it Batman? A new Lego game... Yeah. There oh, is man. a new Lego Batman coming out. I'm not sure if it's what you're talking about. I will need more context. There's a new... It must be Lego Batman. There's a new Lego game that has the Lego characters talking in it. And that's oh. causing a buzz. Because all the previous Lego games have not had talking in them. And that and was the all, charm. A lot of adults have thought of it that is for the best. But focus testing has shown that adults love that there's no talking in them. And kids are like, why the heck are Legos not talking? Because apparently kids already pretend their Legos talk. Yeah, except they, they pretend that they talk in, like, their own voice. It's never going to match up with what the kid thinks, you know? This is going to, like, break their hearts in the way that watching, like, your favorite book get adapted to a movie will. Right. There may actually be a way around that, because the talking in the Lego game is dialogue directly out of a movie. I don't think there's any original voice acting in the Lego oh, game. Oh, please, please tell me it's Batman and Robin. It, oh, man, I Adam West. Let me confirm me. this. No, you know, you know what? I want Lego Batman the Dark Knight. No. I want it that screwed up and that hard to explain to kids what's going on right now. I want it. I want Adam West. We want the 60s Batman the movie. Can, have you played want. the Lego Batman games? It would fit perfectly. <laughs> it would be perfect. We're officially titling this show the one in which Sin downloads the Humble Indie Bundle. Because that just happened. Can do. <laughs> uh, the game is Lego Batman 2. Yep. And um, I'm not finding that it's got audio all from a specific movie, so that might have been hearsay. Like, but the voice actors will be voice actors who have already appeared in other media, so maybe please, the kids will not Please tell be me super Brian surprised. Cox is voicing Batman, because it'll be so great to hear the Brian Cox, like, gritty Batman coming out of a Lego. I know that Lex Luthor is Clancy Brown, for all the good that'll do you. 
Really? We're bringing in Superman's bat? Well, I guess he makes more sense there. You're really telling me Superman can't handle a, an evil businessman? Like, that's his greatest nemesis. An evil, smart businessman. Like, that's on the line for, for Batman to deal with. Batman is a normal super or a normal businessman who just happens to have a lot of money and a pension for punching guys. That's he should be fighting Lex Luthor. Superman should be fighting like sun gods that have come down to earth to destroy everything. I I can't find good evidence for who the voice actors are, but if they already saw Batman movies and those were live action and then it's a Lego Batman game, and it's there's a connection there, if the voices are similar even, then that'll s prevent some of the jarring effect of children imagining different voices. Right. I don't know, I just think there's no way to please kids like that. I, I think exactly the opposite, which is that kids like that will be pleased by fucking anything, up to and including Transformers Beast Wars. <laughs> hey, you can just feed them garbage out of a trash can and they'll eat it up like it's cake right so yeah more E3 we got that I'm gonna uh, quote Jim Sterling's lollipop chainsaw review uh, about this feminism thing its protagonist is overly sexualized to such a comical degree that it feels like less like genuine perversion and more like the product of a miniskirt fetishist on a masculine bridge. On a masculine yeah, bridge. I'm, I'm not gonna deny that. Like, then, wa watching the trailers that specifically highlight the girl's uh, younger and older sisters, this is like 70s camp. Like, we, are, we have crossed the realm of so ridiculous that for a feminist to take offense at the material in Lollipop Chainsaw... Would literally come it's down to like you. You know we're joking, right? No one it's pictures almost like the women question this of why does Supergirl have a chest window when that'd be problematic when she's flying? And the answer is, oh, there is no real reason. We put it there so you can look at her boobs. Whereas the yeah, answer to Power Girl. Chainsaw, Power Girl, is why is she fighting zombies without any you know covering? And the answer is the same reason her boyfriend survives without his body. Right. this is all fucking insane. Because this isn't supposed to make sense. This is clearly not the real world. We're not saying this is an accurate depiction of anything. Well, you kind of have a good reason for it. This is meant to be... Yeah, we, we thought Buffy the uh, Vampire Slayer was kind of cool. And just decided to go all out on a, uh, on a total... Uh, Ritalin, vodka, and stimulants kick, and see what we got. For the same reason why swinging a giant chainsaw sometimes leaves rainbows behind it? I don't know. Yeah, the, the same happens. reason that the chainsaw has heart-shaped holes cut into it. Ta-da. Like, it's interesting that a lot of the, the DLC and extra outfits that come in Lollipop Chainsaw are less fetishized than her standard cheerleading outfit. It, like, if you look at the list of extra outfits, a lot of them are normal clothes. And that's kind uh, of amusing, Another thing really. in my agenda to be nice to anti-feminists and maybe get them to understand is that the people who say that there's objectification of men in media and therefore... Uh, no attention should be paid to the objectification of women. Uh, one of the reasons it's hard to argue against those people is that there's, like, a tiny little kernel of truth in the bottom, which is that it, it everybody is subject to stereotypes, but there are more stereotypes for some people than others, and we only have a limited amount of time to have this discussion. Oh, and also by... I'm, by I'm, I'm, by focusing on people who are less affected by this than people who are more affected by this, you're preventing this discussion from being productive. Also, it, it super offends me. Like, there's a lot of... The, we'll go back to that Kickstarter for the tropes versus women um, example. 
like a lot of those comments were the ones that bothered me weren't like the the death threats and the obvious use of gender based swearing and insults. Um, those I, I hate them, but I understand them. The ones that get me are like the the ones that say these dumb things like men are stereotyped too, or um, oh this is your fault you were asking for it because you enabled the comments. This like attempt to silence the attempts to talk about these things. When talking it's harder about it, it's to so argue important. with people who are only 99% wrong versus the people who are 100% wrong, the death threat people. That's, but, um, they... it, it's, it, it's, it's super awful because you'll, you'll see, it's, it's always like, the, the, you do something on the internet, you, you guys do something on the internet, you'll get death threats or whatever. We, no, we pretty much it's you do anything online Someone's going to get pissed and think that writing a death threat is the appropriate. No, in response. contrast, when women get threatened, right. it's always a sexually based threat, or more often, I should say. More often. Like this is the unfortunate fact of the internet. People um, think they can get away with saying whatever they want with no repercussion whatsoever. The, and the unfortunately, it's make, mostly true. The the other point I was trying to make is. Yes, maybe men get objectified, but it's certainly not the same way. You're not sexually objectified. If that were the case, it would look like, say, an Abercrombie and Fitch ad. Or, there goes our sponsorship right. from it, them. Or, uh, it, it would look more like porn. You would see, for example, a male character who's allegedly armored but wearing, I don't know, assless chaps or nothing but a cod piece. Or something. Yeah, the example I came up with was, well, what if we made Kratos, except he's he doesn't have anything covering his butt, and he's just wearing a spiked cod piece. That's it's it. the scene with oh, Emma Stone like, in Crazy like, Stupid Love, where she says, you look like you're photoshopped. That is... Well, even then, not not to the extent that sometimes women get to. Like, but that is... This is really something experiment I want to try. I, I now want to try to create a video game in which the male characters are all completely butt naked except for a spiked cod piece and see where the demographic for the game lies like this game could have the best gameplay ever but i'm willing to bet at least a portion of the audience is not going to want to play it because of the amount of clothing on the male character and i imagine this I'm just, is i'm just more confused that it's a spiked cod piece specifically well it has to that be seemed like a bad thing yeah, it, it has to be badass like, like that. Like, my which, balls are safe. Which, the, 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 um, unfortunately, the line of badass when it comes to armoring is either dye it black or add spikes. In this case, we could easily do both. Um, Once you go black, you never go back. I, I'm sorry, but in, uh, in, in, can we, can we not? Wow. In, in medieval fantasy, unfortunately, you once you get the most powerful armor, you end up looking more like a dark porcupine than an actual armored individual. Like, the same thing just happened to my Diablo characters. Yeah, I just... I, I, that is a trope I'm really tired of. The I, I somehow wear less clothes to become more powerful. That's, that's a great thematic message right there. Well, it, it's the question of, yes, the, this character may look good. Was she going to look any less attractive wearing more clothes? I mean, I don't see what's wrong here. Like, literally, that's been one of the things that's helped held me back from wanting to try Terra, just knowing that I'm going to look more ridiculous as I gain power. This doesn't make sense. But I, I'll give that... In Blizzard's design for Diablo 3 is phenomenal. The more powerful you get, the more armor you're wearing. It makes sense. My monk is fully covered head to toe. I have a female monk. My demon hunter is fully covered head to toe. As I gain levels, I'm acquiring more armor to represent the fact that things are hitting me harder. I, I think that carries across every single class and every single uh, gender. Male, female, whatever the wizard is supposed to be. Wizard. 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 Of the gender Wizard. <laughs> it's a wizard. It can be whatever it wants. It's cool. Um, but yeah, that it is bothersome. And I do question if we made a game in which 
the male character was wearing only a cod piece, how much of the audience would we just have alienated? Like, admitted, Kratos wasn't wearing much. Kratos still had a fully covered waist. Kratos still had fully covered buttocks. Kratos pretty much only had bare legs, chest, and arms. And, it's, and that, it's a that question as we said earlier, intent. was a power fantasy. In very subtle ways. Well, like my complaint about the Kotaku interview, interview with Ron Rosenberg, is that just if it was designed for the audience to identify with the main character, then that would be much more acceptable than if the main character is designed not to be identified with, like it said, and rather to be the object rather than the I, subject. I mean, does he assume that gender is going to cause people not to identify with this Laura Croft character? Because that seems like the exact opposite that you would want to do in game design. Like, a, a character in a bad situation that has to struggle to fight her way out, that doesn't have anything that shouldn't be identifiable. A character struggling for his or her life. That's a pretty basic thing in the way that pretty much any action movie you ever watch will have that at one point or another. I mean, I if his goal is to make you feel like you want to protect this person, wouldn't the idea be, instead of putting this character in situations that potentially threaten her life, that you just, like, have the infinite ability to spawn protective items for this character? Like, oh, you don't have to go into that dark, scary place. Let me spawn you some food, and, and I'll even spawn your radio so that you can get rescue. Like, that would be the protecting method. I want to play that game. You, you can just spawn things that solve the problems. It'd be like playing The Sims with cheat codes on. Let me just make things that solve really your problems. I was really excited about SimCity, by the way, is it's been on my mind for sort of months that every single video game mechanic revolves around violence. I mean, other than, like, Tetris and Bejeweled, it's, like, all violence in video games. And I don't, I don't think that that makes video game players violent, but it right. seems like there's other interesting things to be done. Yeah, just I, having that as a an alternate goal is really interesting. Which, again, comes back to, we don't want to take away your violent video games. We I just, just want to have a city planning video game also. Just would like to add more, because variety is the spice of life. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, if you watch pretty much any of the feeds of E3 this year, I'd say 70% of the games involve guns. I think that's that's a... A conservative estimate, really. And even the ones that do not involve guns involve, you know, hurting people in other ways. Yeah, typically some kind of violence. There are definitely no dating sims shown at E3 this year. TGS, maybe. It's a shame, because, you know, Japan's got that down. That does not seem to be very popular here. Actually, story in games doesn't seem to be particularly popular here. Uh, I, I love when I can get a game with a great story. I just think it's the exception rather than the rule. The third and final Twitter hubbub that occurred on my Twitter feed this week, apparently this has been a good week for Twitter, is that FunnyJunk.com sent a letter to Matthew Inman, or their oh, lawyer yeah. did, requesting, was it $50,000? $20,000. $20,000 as payment for slander that, that the Oatmeal alleg allegedly did against Funny Junk when there was a comic stating that, hey, Funny Junk steals all my shit. And as and everybody knows, yeah. Funny Junk absolutely does steal everything on the Oatmeal and everywhere else on the internet. And more and importantly, money makes it. money off of it. Yeah. And so, in response to this, Matthew Inman, a notoriously, you know, cranky dude who does not respond well to threats or anything <laughs> negative then <Flops. laughs> ruins this lawyer's day by raising $20,000, which is now $100,000, taking a picture of it, sending it to the lawyer, and then donating the money to the National Wildlife Federation and the American Cancer Society as 
associated with a comic he made of a bear with cancer having sex with the lawyer's mother. <laughs> Operation you want the, you want the bear to not be bear. six. You want to cure that bear's cancer so that it can keep having sex with the lawyer's mother. Well done. <laughs> there's there's I, not I much you can respond there. to that with. I, I, I edit out most of the silences in the show, but that one's just gonna. That, you know, that one's saying is a, a like, salute to awkward. Uh, tell me about Wreck It Ralph, Sen. The heck is this thing? So, Wreck It Ralph is. The movie. Okay, one more thing. I just want to come up with the. as uh, There are still 14 days left. The goal was 20000 He's currently at $128,883. In about an hour, I think it's like 64 minutes, he reached his goal. Okay, we can move on. To, we can move on now. Fair love, good. We at Nerd Talk do not know about actual Ralph. bestiality. Unless the animal is intelligent and possesses language and thereby consents. I love that he didn't even, like, provide any kind of, like... Hey, donate this much money and get this. Nope. <laughs> it's cheery. Donate this money to just fuck over this jackass lawyer. Yep. Donate in money. Terms of screw pride. that guy. I just I loved that. Um, what was it? NBC, MSNBC, who had the interview with him that I linked you earlier. I I loved that interview just for the quotes from him, where he's musing on, I don't know how I'm gonna get to withdraw a hundred thousand dollars just so that I can take a picture of it. I think I'm going to need to get an armored truck. <laughs> I love that, that. That seems like a dangerous amount of cash to have around, yes. Right. He just wants to withdraw Especially to take a photo. Especially when everybody on thing. the internet knows to be watching you now. Yup. Alright, anyway. So, we're going to talk about Wreck-It Ralph. And we've got to get through this quickly because we're running super long. Okay, we can do this super quick. Wreck-It Ralph, it's a new movie coming out from Disney. It's about a video game villain who gets sick of his job and decides to go try other games. It's like super cool references to all of gaming. It's like, got good licensing, too. Yeah. We, it, like, they've got. Specifically, just highlighted in the trailer from everywhere yeah, in it. We've got, in, in a villain support group room, we've got Bison, the ghost from Pac-Man, uh, Zangief, the zombie from House of the Dead... Dr. Robotnik, like, all of these the, Those are just the ones we think of off the top of our head. Dr. Bowser. Who? Bowser was in it. Bowser was sitting I, in the chair. Ah, uh, let's see. I know I've seen I don't Hubert recognize it when you say Dr. Robotnik. I need you to tell Egg me Eggman, name. Eggman, the hell. Oh, okay. Now I know who you're talking about. Right. So screw you, he's always been Robotnik to me. So we've got <laughs> all of these characters just in the trailer. Eggman's a dumb name. You're dumb Eggman person. is such a dumb name. And Robotnik is really cool sounding. I, like everyone else, am heartbroken that Sega it totally refuses to acknowledge Robotnik and has Eggman in all the new Especially games. since I, I have a I have an affection for calling him Robotnik. Because I'm mentally <laughs> like eight years old apparently. It's not even like they use both. It's that they pretend that Robotnik never happened. If you called him Eggman and Robotnik, if Eggman was like an insult that would make sense. And Robotnik was his real name? Nope. They just pretend that his name can, is Robotnik and always has been. Thing? So yes, it's a trailer for the movie. It's super freaking cool. You should check it out. You should probably watch it more than once to see like if you can catch all of the extra characters in it, because they kind of go by them really quickly. Right. Like, one of the, one of the, I don't usually advocate watching commercials like at all, but this one is like, yeah, watch it more than once. This trailer was super cool. On the other end of the spectrum of cool movie trailers, we've got a trailer for a movie called Branded, which is like complete brain screwing so charged with like in-depth messages about our, our advertising created society that it hurts. And you should watch it because Wait, the so trailer so should be absolutely terrifying to most of you. It, it's about a guy who has a nervous breakdown and quits his advertising job because he's like getting this dark sinister feeling that something else is happening and then after his breakdown he steps out into the world again finally and realizes that oh crap i was right he starts seeing like 
advertising monsters looming over the city that take the form of these weird, like, gelatinous tentacle monsters that are, like, just eating people's brains. And so he ends up starting his own advertising company with the goal of shutting all of this down, and it looks crazy and cool. This reminds me of They Live. Here to kick ass and chew bubble You gum. know what? I think I found an idea. Instead of aliens, you're advertising actually. monsters. Lollipop chainsaw? I think so. Um, actually, I was referring to something else. Oh, what else? I'm going to send you an email. I was going to try to do a quick link of Bas or a quick review of Bastion. I'm going to send an email to the both of you. Right. You can check that out. Well, as it stands, um, yeah, I think that covers it for us for the week. We've Great, got so a, where are we going for lunch? We've got a lot so, of work wait, to do. I forgot which podcast this was. Stuff. Um, we've got to we've got to pick up a copy of Lollipop Chainsaw now because you guys are going to make me do a let's play. Whew, I I get a feeling we should probably break that up into like hour chunks. Absolutely. If for no other reasons than technical ones, like trying to upload five hours of video audio content is going to be a nightmare. Jim Sterling claims that it is not a long game, six hours on its first playthrough. So we could actually break that up into like an hour every week for like a month and a half. and That could be a totally. thing. Totally. Anyway, so we don't actually need this stuff in the actual recording, so we should just wrap up. In the meantime, I'm Pixie. I'm Sun. And I'm Pyrosin. And we'll catch you next week on Nerd Talk.